Well, Kermit, you and I have, have never spoken before, so why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure, sure. Uh, it's actually Kemet. Uh, Kemet. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, no worries. It's, uh, it'd be very surprising if you got it right in the first try. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I can give you like a, a bridged uh, background info on me and maybe tell you about what I want to talk to you about today. Perfect. Um, so uh, I had many careers in my life, but um, I started off as a, in the U.S. Air Force. I was uh, in the Air Force for about six years as a Mandarin Chinese linguist. Um, and then after I got out of the Air Force, I uh, left the U.S. to go move to China for about um, four years, uh, where I lived for a while, um, just learning the culture out there. I thought it'd be a shame to, you know, learn all the Mandarin language and not, not go to the country where it's actually spoken. Um, after that, I came back to the U.S., uh, earned my MBA, and uh, I went on to work for uh, Apple for a number of years uh, in their corporate secrecy program, um, basically <laughs> making sure no one found out about the newest uh, iterations of the iPhone or your know, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, pretty, pretty wild stuff. Um, wild. Yeah, yeah, it was a really interesting position. So um, what I've been doing more recently, I left Apple about uh, two years ago, and what I've been working on more recently is what I was interested to kind of have a conversation with you about. Um, and it's twofold. The, uh, the first one is um, the self-authoring collaboration group that uh, I actually run on Facebook, which is, um, as it sounds, a, a group on Facebook where we have about a thousand or so members now. And it's a place that people can come to find support around uh, Jordan Peterson's self-authoring program, um, which has been a tremendous help to me and is helping lots and lots of people. So it's kind of like a, a side project for me to have that group, which has resources and a space for discussion and question and answer, and really just motivation around the exercise. Wow. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's one thing I'm working on. Um, but my full-time job and my, my main project right now is at The Character Arc, which is uh, it's a blog, it's community, it's a podcast, it's an online course, and that has a kind of a twofold mission. And one of those missions is to kind of foster in people a relationship with fiction. Um, so it's a kind of building people's uh, connection to their own resonance with stories in a way that helps to make pro progress in our lives, like in very practical ways, like not, not too abstract, very practical. Um, and the other is um, to kind of foster this sense of uh, togetherness that I think is only found through story. I think that story and fiction, um, grand stories, you know, like, like the Bible and like mythological stories, but also some of the everyday stories that we, that we enjoy have something really deep to say about um, us that's undeniable and it gets us past our differences to some extent. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's kind of my, uh, my, my mini intro there. I, I'm, I am super excited about this. I, cause this is, this is so, this is so right up my alley. I've never done the self authoring program. I think I'm a little old for it because so much of the life is behind me, but, but you know, it very much fits in with my meetup groups and because, you know, obviously when the Jordan Peterson thing happened, I watched all of these people get excited about Jordan Peterson. And part of me knew from, you know, my religious, my religious work that people get excited about something, but if they don't have a track to follow, if they don't have a community, a community to be a part of, it's all become some momentary excitement. And then you tend to regress back to where you were. Exactly and right. so uh, self-offering collaboration, Facebook, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear about this. This is exciting. Yeah, yeah. It's really, I mean, it's been really helpful to people too. So that's really gratifying. Um, well, first off, I would say, you know, obviously you've seemed to, you know, I'm sure you have all, your, your life seems to be going fairly well and you've got yourself together. Um, and that's not necessarily a prerequisite for, you know, not having to do this, the, the future authoring program or self-authoring, but we have members in our group who are in their 80s, 70s and 80s. Really? So, you still do it? Yeah. And they, they ask that question a lot where they're like, well, is it too late for me? And it's like, well, do you want to create a vision of the future that, uh, you know, can motivate you to move towards it? But, you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, the group, yeah, definitely. There's a lot of people who join because of that, what I like to call the, uh, the gym membership problem, right? Where people, ah. you know, they buy a gym membership and to them, they're like, that is the act that's going to get me in shape. But, you know, then they don't use it and then you feel guilty about not using it and it's worse off than you were before. So yeah, that happens a lot with, with programs like self-authoring and online courses in general, which have abysmally low uh, completion rates. Yep. So um, it's really good to have people in a place where they're seeing that other people are there with them also, um, yep. doing the same program and that they can ask questions to and work through it with. 
But now you, I mean, you had a career in the army, you lived in China, you worked for Apple, you are also not the stereotype of the basement dweller covered with Cheetos, wasting his life on porn and video games. That is not your story either, quite clearly. Maybe not at the moment, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, tell me, you know, so how did you find Jordan Peterson? How did you get into the self-authoring thing? And then start a Facebook group. Tell me a little, flesh that out a little bit more for me, if you could. Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, I, I guess like a lot of people, I found out about Jordan Peterson and, um, you know, particularly his book, uh, 12 Rules for Life was the first thing I really read from him. Um, and it was a friend of mine, a really close friend of mine who read it and told me, you got to read this book. And he was more vehement about it than most things that he tells me about. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, why not? I'll give it a shot. And so I actually listened to it uh, on a long drive. I did, I listened to the audio book and um, I li I've listened to the whole thing straight through and it was amazing. You know, I mean, I'm sure you've heard about that experience that people have had before. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, there were the, the self-help elements of his work that I found really interesting and compelling, but there was the deeper element, which it also interested me, did me in the past uh, of, you know, this connection with stories and, and archetypes and um, how, what, how that can be actually useful to people in a very practical way that connected with me and led me to kind of go on and read Maps of Meaning and then, you know, dive into all of his lectures for, for maybe too much time, but definitely <laughs> lots of time. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I have had those, these various live lives, I guess, in, in, in different spheres. And that's kind of why I, I kind of refer to myself as like a transition expert now, because I've just been transitioning lots during my life. But it hasn't always been easy. And um, a lot of times I've found myself in the different places I've transitioned to, not really knowing what to do next, um, not really understanding, like, what were my opportunities? Like, how do I actually move towards them? You know, how do I pick one thing over another thing? And so I'm not at all um, unaware or, like, not involved with those same challenges that a lot of people face. And the fact that I've had the opportunity to move um, from those various things I told you about um, to other things that were interesting also was really more a function of just, um, I think the, the fact that I had a lot of help and um, that I had a lot of people I could rely on who consistently gave me the, the push really to go outside of my comfort zone. And so I think doing that can become a practice in itself and that by getting good at practicing that, it helps you get good at transitioning. Yeah. So anyway, Jordan Peterson's work was kind of plugged right into my interests and also into my, my work at the character arc, which, just kind of turned into a rabbit hole that I'm still in the, in the midst of falling down. Oh, wonderful. Well, tell me more about your interest in stories and the character arc. Um, I'm very curious about that too, because I don't know, uh, you know, some people have listened to all my videos, which is frankly amazing. Well, just two hours a day. Um, oh, but, <laughs> but, you know, but as a pastor, one of the things that I see as a pastor, I am, I help people curate their stories. And in pastoral care, I think in many ways is helping them figure out the relationship between the story outside and the story inside the story God is working. I mean, all of this stuff, that's what I do as a pastor. So I'm, I'm deeply interested in stories. So, so how did, how did you come upon this and, and where has this taken you? Sure. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I, I, that idea is, I think a really deep one in, in a lot of the kind of therapeutic uh, literature as far as, you know, narrative therapy and, you know, even elements of like CBT are based on the idea of taking your story and translating it into something that makes sense so that you can move yeah. forward. Yeah. And that idea was something I was exposed to, uh, luckily, fairly early on in my life. I, I had a, I struggled with some depression when I was uh, younger, when I was in college. Um, when I was in college the first time, I kind of had two college careers that, before I moved on. But um, I, uh, I feel that those kind of, um, that experience of having that deep depression and recognizing that it was unsustainable as a way to kind of go through life made me start seeking out ways of changing that, getting out of that. And so I kind of got interested in personal development and a lot of the different schools of thought that surrounded that. And um, that always was separate for me from my love of fiction. I've always been like a huge movie buff and like, you know, books and comics, every, pretty much everything that I can get my hands on. And, um, I started tying those things together several years ago um, after I was, I was watching a movie that I really, that I've grown to love very much. And uh, I had this experience where I left the theater and I had, I was with my best friend watching this movie and I had to go, you know, into the bathroom in the theater, into the stall afterwards so I could cry my face off <laughs> because wow. I was so impacted by the story. Yeah. And, I, but, and that to me was, that is something that happened to me before, but it wasn't something that I thought of, well, why is that happening? You know, 
And if that's such a deep fundamental human experience as it is, isn't there must be something about it that's more important than just entertainment. You know, I yes. think we use stories as entertainment now. That's the only way that we relate to them. But um, I don't think that's true at all. I think that when you're watching a, a movie or you're interacting with a great story, you're, you're interacting with it, right? And so if something is happening to you at the same time as you're watching it, I think that's what happens with great works of literature. That's what happens when you read the Bible, I think. It's, yep. The yep. story changes you in some way. And um, it's kind of the way that wisdom is transmuted, is translated to, to you. Um, and so I had that experience directly and I realized I wanted to learn more about it. So I just started reading everything I get my hands on about that subject. And um, it really opened up this world to me of, of, of you know, all the things that, uh, that Jordan Peterson often talks about as far as the archetypes and like psychoanalytic theory and um, all of that I realized was something I could use for myself to, to help me make decisions. And so, um, so when I started thinking about the character arc, I started realizing that I had been doing that for myself for a long time and that this relationship I had formed with stories had really been the, the linchpin in my having all the experiences I had because I always had somewhere I could look that would tell me exactly what it was that I admired, right? Because I could like mine the stories for the wisdom in them, for the ways of acting in them that I respected, and I could kind of emulate them in some way. And so I actually think that the, you know, the resonance that you feel with a story is in some ways like... Um, a scaled down version of like the religious experience, you know, it's, it's like, a, I don't know that it's scaled down. Well, it, uh, yeah, I don't think it has to be scaled down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I would agree. With that. I think that's, that's a, a good observation. There's, um, there's definitely something in it that can be religious in nature. I mean, that's obviously the, when you're interacting with a religious story, that's what's happening. Sure. But I think it happens even to a lesser extent with maybe stories that aren't quite as old or as deep. Right. Um, because right. they reflect those same things. Right. And um, so I, I basically tried to build that into something, some coherent form that was iteratable and communicable to other people so that, you know, other people could benefit from it in the same way. And that's kind of where the, the idea behind the character art came from. Wow. I'm, I'm thrilled by this. I don't know if, so one of the, another one of the scholars I've been following is John Verveke, also of University of Toronto. Yes, and, yes. you know, one of the things that he he articulated quite well, which was something actually I'd thought of, I've been thinking about for a number of years before I started this whole thing was, was how in many ways, I mean, if you ask someone what a human being is, one of the, one of the deepest things we are is in fact a story. And I think in some ways that would sometimes will people say, well, what is a soul? And a, a soul is, is closer to a story than I think certainly closer than a closer to a story than it is to some substance or some, you know, little thing inside of us. And this of course gets into, you know, what I believe in terms of God and, and the resurrection and all. I mean, so theologically story has a big part to play in how I see theology work and, and how the Christian story I think is something that we inhabit and live within. So I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to, I'm, I'm so glad that you found me and that you, uh, that you put in a, this is, this is why I do these talks to meet people like you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so glad I found, found your work as well, because I mean, that's the reason I reached out was because I could see that you're kind of talking about a lot of those things that I'm extremely interested in. Uh, and you talked to so many interesting people too, that I just figured I have to try to, you know, get into your orbit to, to be a part of it. Well, I've, I've taken too much of your time and we only have an hour. I, I suspect we'll want to talk again at some point and I, I certainly want to, but so, so what was on your mind for this talk and let's, uh, let's proceed with that. Okay. Um, well, you know, I didn't have a real solid structure or any like, you know, okay. thing I wanted to convey specifically. Um, I really wanted to just get a sense of your relationship with, with story. I mean, you know, you've talked about it in snippets here and there with other people. I wanted to try to drill down into it as much as you're willing to. As okay. far as your personal relationship with, you know, you have a stronger understanding of the Bible than I do. Um, I've really only recently started um, looking to the Bible more as a source of like foundational stories and like really digging into the meanings behind them. And like, you know, listening to people like Jordan Peterson and reading people like Northrop Fry, uh, yeah. who's had a huge influence on me lately, has, uh, has really opened up the, the world of that to me. So I'd be interested to hear maybe two things, right? One, you know, what are your favorite stories in the Bible? Because I think that says a lot about what it is that you do. And then also um, just what other stories have, have had an influence on you in your life? If that's not too broad a question to ask you. Wow. 
I, I could talk for a long time. If you look at my YouTube channel, there's plenty of evidence of that. Um, I, but like I said, it was, it was probably 10 years ago or so. I, you know, many of the issues that attracted me to the Jordan Peterson conversation, I was, I was thinking a lot about in terms of how in this, in this, when I say materialist culture, I don't mean consumerist culture, although it is that too, and that impacts it, but a culture that is deeply that is deeply persuaded by a materialist uh, scientific perception of the world. How can I commute? What is what exactly is the gospel, and how can we talk about it in a way that people within our culture find accessible? And I, and you know, part of what I was really thinking about was in fact the soul. And I was asking myself, well, what, what exactly is a soul? And so, you know, I, you know, I was reading, you know, as a pastor, you're always reading the Bible because you're always preparing messages from the Bible. And, you know, then you just, some of the, some of the things that, that don't occur to you unless you're working with the Bible in Greek or Hebrew you know, so then you, well, what, what, what is this, what is this word that gets translated as soul often? Well, especially when Jesus talks about if you gain the whole world, but lose your, some translations will translate that soul. Some translations will translate that self. And it's like, and, and the Greek word is actually psyche. Mm. And so if you'd say, what would it, you know, if you gain the whole world, but lose your, your psyche, you think, mm. well, that, See, we use psyche is close enough to a whole bunch of things in our yeah. in our verbal domain that well that gets interesting, and and so I began to think about what the soul is and how God relates to the soul, and and what the Bible is and how we function within this 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 story verse as I call it, and you know so a lot of my thinking lately has been okay what's the relationship between the you know the matter verse you know, of which this little cell phone stand is a part and the story verse, which is this conversation that you and I are having where you and I are, are trading, are trading stories in little bits and forms and words over this. And, and you have this story that you have lived and your story is of course nested in, you know, innumerable other stories. And your story is in many ways, the product of innumerable other stories. And as is mine, and there are alignments between our stories and, differences between our stories. And, and so all of this for me was, was working through these questions of, well, what, what exactly are we? And, and what exactly is the nature of this world? And, and how, what, what actually governs that which is most real? One of the definitions I've been wrestling with is what is real? Well, that which is most real is that which governs. And, and in, in many ways, any pastor or psychologist would note that for most of us, a lot of what governs is, in fact, our stories. Our, our stories place us at a point in time when we're born to parents with stories, to, to tribes with stories, to nations with stories. And, and then you begin to appreciate that the Bible is in many ways, you know, the original fandom. That the Bible is as you know, the reason Northrop Fry got into the Bible was he, he began to appreciate what a formative book this was. And, and what's, you know, people, people in our culture are skeptical about the Bible. But one of the things I point out to them is, okay, so let's, let's say you, you can't, you have difficulty with supernatural things, you know, so just set all that aside mm -hmm. and, and just look at the actual history of the book and what it has done in human history. And so when Jordan Peterson, when he started the first biblical series, when he starts talking about the Bible, that came through bright and clear, that this book has formed and shaped the world in a way that is, miraculous is about really the only word we can put to how, how formative the Bible has been for human history. And it's the kind of book I remember, you know, part of, so certain 
conservative religious groups like Wycliffe Bible translators. They had it as their mission to go to tiny little people groups that don't even have a written language, live in with this group, learn their language, which nobody else knows probably, figure out a way to bring it to writing, and then start translating the Bible into that writing and then give them the Bible. And many times in places like Vietnam or China, then the missionaries have to go because you know it's a political yeah. thing or whatever. So they have to go. And so you leave, if you were to do this with just about any other book in the world, the people would probably look at it and say, well, what do we do with it? Well, it's kind of good for burning. You know, we can start fires with these things that they left us. But, yeah. but what has happened in the wake of leaving the Bible with people is that, well, what we've seen throughout history, um, is that they start to read it. And first of all, they understand it at some point. And that is a phenomenal thing. Yeah. And, and usually, as in China, as in many places in Africa, once the European missionaries leave, well, the people take the book, they start to read it, and what comes out of it is something that is clearly their own. It's yeah. their own culture. It's their own thing. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, others can look in and say, yeah, there's all kinds of differences and uniquenesses, but we can recognize this as something we can recognize over here. That yeah. is, so that is a phenomenal thing. And yeah. so I, to have, then to have Jordan Peterson say, you know, there's something about this book. I thought, huh, are we going to do this again now to this post-Christian world? It's mm -hmm. fascinating to watch. Yeah. No, I, that's, that's actually really interesting that there's, there's two things about that that I wanted to, to maybe mention. Um, another Northrop Frye reference, um, he, was, I think he said something like, um, knowledge is of the specific and wisdom is of the general. Ah. You know, so saying, you know, knowledge is about what do I know about what is happening right now? What is about what to do in a, a specific situation? And wisdom is about what types of situation arise and what to do across them, right? Like wisdom is re related to story in a, in a real way, like. Uh-oh. Oh, no, no. Well, you were, you were, you were talking about Northrop Fry. knowledge is of the specific and wisdom is of the general. I, that, that's, so keep going. Okay. Okay. So uh, I think what I was saying was something like um, that, what that implication of that is that, you know, wisdom is related to story in a causal way. Like you can't have wisdom without some point A to point B structure, right? It's built in, it's built into the structure of wisdom. Now that doesn't mean that just by being inside of time, you become wise, but to some extent, it does mean that, like wisdom comes with experience. We all we all know that. And um, one other thing that you know he talked about in um, you know some of his lectures on the Bible was the fact that you know the Bible that exists that's most important is the Bible in the mind. You know, and he's talking about you know the Bible, but this applies to stories more broadly. I think, which is you know when you by reading the Bible or by reading any book, you take that story and you build it into the structure of your own existence. And so it changes, you know, the way it changes you is by making itself a part of you. And so then you actually are like, you know, drinking of, of the wisdom of, of those stories in order to gain the wisdom of the people who wrote them. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was an unbelievably powerful idea because it, it means that, um, that you can actually, you know, gain wisdom through this medium that has nothing to do with your own experience. And that the, what comes from that, right, the, the way that your mind uh, exists after reading the Bible or after reading that story, that is the story to you. Like that, that story is more important. And his his contention, he said, I think he said this about uh, Milton. John Milton was that, or was it? No, William Blake. It was William Blake. He said um, his belief was that the Bible that was in the mind was the more important Bible. It was the story that you had taken in and was now a part of you. And then it it, it transformed. So that was kind of what you were saying about the tribes that that get the Bible. Who, then they transform into something that's specific to them. That fits exactly with what I'm saying. And 
from on a more personal level, um, you know, if you're talking about, you know, someone who's not reading the Bible, but they're, they're watching The Lion King or they're, they're watching their favorite movie or whatever story connects with them, what's happening is that story is having an influence on, the, on them that's changing something inside of them and, and they're making it their own. And so um, one of the things that in the character arc that, uh, in the character arc course that I walk people through is a process of figuring out what the story is for you, not just what the story is for a general audience. You know, I think that if you look at stories as something that's outside of yourself, that you, that everyone is having the same experience with, you're missing the part of the story that relates specifically to you. Because if you look at that part, it tells you exactly what matters to you. It's like actually like it's a reflection of something about yourself, not just about the story itself. So, yeah. Well, I, oh, I love, I love this. I love this. I love this. This is great. <laughs> Yes, yeah, um, this is my favorite thing to do is talk about this stuff. Oh, I, this is this is this is so helpful. This is so good. You asked me about you know influential stories in my yes. life. I read, I first read. Well, so so my father was a was a was a pastor as well, and he was a big C.S. Lewis fan. And so one of the things that he did when we were children was he read through the Chronicles of Narnia for us. So the Narnia Chronicles were big books for us growing up. But then when I got now I was I was dyslexic, and so for me, audio books and audio courses are really helpful. I mean, I obviously can't read. Um, I've got a few books in my <laughs> life, but you know, for me, auditory, and also I learned to play the violin with the Suzuki method in first grade, which was also auditory. So auditory is a big deal for me. And um, but early on in junior high, I found Tolkien, and I first read The Hobbit, and then I read Lord of the Rings. And it was junior high or high school, I don't remember. But, you know, and I played Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, all that stuff in the, in the late 70s. And, and, you know, Tolkien for me just became, you know, I, as, a, as a kid, you know, I read Tolkien and I, I wanted so much to live in that world. I mean, the hobbits and the dwarves and, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, Dungeons and Dragons was a game that, in a sense, you did sort of live in a Tolkien-esque world with your other nerdy friends in school where <laughs> other people had dates on Saturday night. No, we nerds, we just, you know, <laughs> we were too scared of women. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in that category too. <laughs> That's right. But, but then Tolkien... Tolkien, you know, was, was deeply, um, was deeply influential. And then it's interesting because I hadn't done anything with it for years. And then the uh, Lord of the Rings movies came out. And so I reread the books and then I started, you know, I, I had five, I have five kids. And so when they're of a certain age, you drive them to school and back and to sports and back. And so I had lots of car time. And so I'd often play things like the audiobook of the Lord of the Rings in the car. And as a family, we had this, this Christmas tradition where every year we all sit down and watch the extended version of the Lord of the Rings all the way through. And the, nobody can stomach the Hobbit movies because they, they just went off the rails with those. Yeah, yeah. But too long. yeah, but the, you know, and then, and then I became interested in Tim Keller in the mid aughts around 2006 and got into Tim Keller's work on the Lord of the Rings, Peter Kreef's work on the Lord of the Rings. The Tolkien professor was a podcast podcasts were coming online. And so the Lord of the Rings for me has been just a, a, a really powerful narrative. And then all of the movie stuff that comes through my kids, of course, read Harry Potter I hadn't mm -hmm. read the books. I didn't find them particularly well written, but I thought yeah. the I thought the stories were powerful. And you know, I was you know in '76, I was 13 years old, so I was prime at the Star Wars age. So I've I've yeah. enjoyed the movies and all of those stories as well. Yeah, those are fascinating. Those are, those uh, those are great examples because those are all kind of they were the story at the time when they came out. You know, like the the Lord of the Rings. That was it for everyone at that time who was interested in that, in that arena. And it's interesting that, you know, I feel like the audience for those kind of stories has grown, you know, there was, yes. it's fairly niche. Even when I was younger, um, it was much niche, you know, for fairly niche to be interested in Lord of the Rings or like fantasy or sci-fi. That was kind of like a fringe um, thing, but it became more and more mainstream with things like, like Harry Potter and like, um, like Star Wars. And I, I actually was thinking about this recently. There's, 
there's a certain element in those stories, not at, with, it's, it's in Lord of the Rings, but not as much, sorry, it's in Lord of the Rings to some degree, but very strong in Harry Potter and Star Wars. There's always this idea um, in the biggest stories of our time. Uh, you see it in Game of Thrones also, and it's, uh, it underlies the, the thing, and I think it's reflective of the modern era to a degree. And it's this, this idea of the magic having left the world. It's like, uh, you know, Harry Potter, he's in the muggle world and he's got no connection to the magic. And then he goes off into this world where it still exists. Star Wars, you know, the Jedi are long gone. And they thought that some people think they're a myth, but then he rediscovers the force. And uh, Game of Thrones, you know, the dragons are hatched in the first, was the first episode, definitely the first season. And, um, I haven't seen Game of Thrones, so I, oh, I, I know spoiler. nothing about it. And, um, I don't know if I'll watch it someday, because TV watching is something I do with my wife, and so I just leave up to her what we watch. Oh, okay. Well, you, you've heard of it at least, I'm yes, sure, because yes. everybody's talking about it. Yeah. Well, I read those books uh, long when they first started coming out, and um, that element in them is very strong. They started off very not fantasy. It was kind of like a, a kingdom uh, you know, and, and fighting story of, like, of people, but there wasn't too much magic in it but the magic kind of seeps back into the world as the story goes on. And I think that theme is, is, is so prevalent right now because of the fact that we're losing this connection to stories. And so the stories are reflecting the loss of the magic of stories. And so all the stories that we really resonate with as a culture, you know, individually too, but as a culture have something to do with the fact that there's something missing, right? There's something missing. This, the grounding stories of our culture are, are lost. And so all the stories have people going out and finding that, rediscovering that story, which is equal to the magic of the universe. So, yeah. That's... Well, maybe you've pushed me to start reading the books because... Oh, <laughs> are they? Are they? Well, okay. My take on it, I, you know, I have very... I'm very persnickety with my tastes about... Uh, about <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't to be a nerd is to be a snob of a certain <laughs> of a certain take. That's right. A little bit. I don't begrudge anyone their taste, you know. But uh, I but my taste is is obviously better than everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought the first three books in the Game of Thrones series were amazing. They're some of the best fantasy I've ever, I've ever read. Um, and then I think they went sharply downhill. So, um, but but while they were good, they were very very good. So I would say you know if you're at all inclined, then there's something there's they're definitely worth checking out. Well, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I'm a big Audible user, so I'll probably, I'll probably start on them then because I'm, I love fantasy and I haven't, I, you know, there, like I said, my, my TV watching time is about the only time I watch TV is when I do it with my wife. And so I let, she at least gets a say most of the time if I, you know, I'd rather say, okay, honey, you pick it. Cause then I know she'll, she'll like, or at least be to blame about what we've been watching instead of me. Yeah. So just yeah, a yeah. marriage strategy after 30 years. That's a smart one. Yeah. But, but now um, I, I, this idea of the return of enchantment is such a, such an important one because, you know, a lot of my videos, so I've lots of videos with conversations with people, but the videos that I make where I'm just kind of thinking out loud, that's a huge theme of where what I'm working on right now to look at a guy like Owen Barfield who was a friend of C.S. Lewis because okay. Barfield very much imagined that you know there was a time there's a participatory time where you know the the um, wind and spirit weren't two separate words but were one word and okay. the view outside and the view inside was the same and then there was the split time and I've been very involved in that split is what you know, made me notice Jordan Peterson, got me into Verveke, and has been working through the philosophy and this and this long story of the split, because at some point you're looking for the reunification of heaven and earth. Mm. And mm. and so that that question of re-enchantment, but the re-enchantment isn't just a return to the past. It's you in a sense, I hate to sound terribly Hegelian, but you in a sense subsume the split in the new synthesis. Mm. And, you know, I, that, that question, obviously as a Christian, so as a Christian, I, I am a, as a conservative Christian, I am a believer in the old stories. You know, I don't, I don't disbelieve miracles or the miraculous as a person who lives in the modern world, in the secular world, I appreciate the power and the, and I appreciate the skepticism 
that. Mm -hmm. And so I've been paying a lot of attention lately to the Reformation where a lot of these issues came, you know, really got together and, and became enjoined. And, and modern Luther was this pivotal figure, is a medieval man who ushers in the modern world. Mm. But now, in a sense, we're coming to the end of the modern world and realizing we can't live in this world. And mm. so, but we can't just reappropriate the past. And so that's, in a sense, where John Verveke's course is at, because Verveke is not a Christian. He's a physicalist, as he describes himself in terms of his, his metaphysic. But these questions of, we, we now appreciate in the meaning crisis, we can't live with the decisions that we've made. We can't mm -hmm. live with the losses that we have incurred. So how do we move forward? And now, obviously, as a Christian minister, I encourage people to re-enter the Christian story. But as we re-enter it in the 21st century, it's not the same as it was in the first century or the 12th century or the 16th century or even the 20th century anymore. So yeah. I'm going to have to read those, the, probably those first three George R. R. Martin books because that theme really intrigues me. Yeah, it's a fascinating one. And um, oh, yeah, I'd say definitely check those out if, you, if, you, if you're inclined. And I'd love to hear what you think about the, the ones after the first three if you keep going because uh, yeah, I, I always want to talk about that kind of stuff. But um, I, you know, when you were saying that, the, that one... Um, you know, that eventually the two, the split is subsumed underneath the new structure. That to me reminds me of, you know, when well, you hear Jordan Peterson often talk about the Osiris and Horus dichotomy, yes. you know, where yes. you have to rescue the father and then in the end, the, the ascendant God is a, is a combination of Osiris and Horus. It's the yes. revolutionary hero and the structure of culture behind them. Yes. And so it seems like that's kind of, a, I, I at least hope that's where we are, you know, where we're at the point where we're reunifying because it seems uh, necessary, but it's also... Uh, yeah, it seems like it's it's one of those mythologically re reoccurring themes. Yes. And, you know, I think that the approach that you take as, as a minister, of course, as, as a pastor is is important because it it's trying to do the same thing, I think, to a degree that um, maybe other people are trying to do in a more secular fashion, which is to bring people back to these foundational stories. Yes. And the reason why I think the uh, that the character arcs mission to me is, is, is important is because what I'm hoping, at least, and what it seemed to have been able to do in the past is be like a gateway towards um, a deeper understanding of the religious stories, because it's a little bit too much of a challenge, I think. It would have been for me, for sure, you know, maybe five years ago even, to say, hey, check out you know, the Bible, it's, it's great. You know, that's, that's a tough sell for modern people. Yeah. Um, but if you say, hey, check out Star Wars or Harry Potter or whatever your favorite movie is, um, no one can be cynical about those things. And it's not just they can't be cynical, it's that what they're connecting to is the, the the archetypal structure of that story yeah. that is that comes from these these mythological stories that are in the Bible that are in the other great religious and mythological traditions. Yeah. So I think that by encouraging people to form a relationship with fiction that is um, that's based on the stories that they enjoy, you know, not necessarily the stories that I pick out for them. They it gives them an understanding of the potential of that, which I think eventually will lead them to the deepest stories that there are. I mean, it, it has to. Yeah. And so, I've seen that kind of happen, and I think it, I think it's a good kind of a gateway way and you know backdoor in. I I agree, and and I you know one of the things I haven't talked about this much lately, but you know if if you if you're such a Star Wars fan that you dress up as one of the characters, I mean the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I went to that you know back when I was in college, and I remember going there for the first time, and it's like what is going on here in the theater? Everybody's going to the midnight movie with Rocky Horror Picture Show and they're dressing up and they're singing along. And yeah. as a college student, I just kind of watched that. I didn't understand it. And then of course, Star Wars comes along and people go to, you know, even if it's the prequels, these crappy Star Wars movies, and, but they dress up as the characters and it's like something's going on here. And then one of the things that I realized is that essentially what, ha what the church is, is if you like dressing up and, meeting someone else who's dressed up and you think, boy, I wish I could live into that story. In a sense, what the church is trying to do is, well, here is a community that we're living in the story, but here's the challenge. Instead of just a Friday night meeting a few friends, dressing up as, you know, as Luke or, or, you know, Princess Leia, um, how, what does it mean if you're going to live 24-7 in that story and live 24-7 in that story when you're going to work? 
And mm -hmm. when you're, you know, dealing with a contentious neighbor or a family conflict and well, that's both exciting and if you think about it enough, a little terrifying, yeah. but that, that is, that is supposed to be what the church is. And that is not something that I think that is something that especially in the, that the church, especially Protestant churches lost, I think mm -hmm. to a degree because of the ancient liturgical preservation that let's say the Orthodox and the Catholics have managed to have that, that even though it wasn't necessarily articulated in that way, that was part of what was happening in the church. And even people who said, well, I can't believe anything of it. I still go to walk into the cathedral and watch the pageantry and inhabit that aesthetic experience. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this very much is how we as human beings live and yeah. want to live. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the, same, it's the same as seeing, you know, like you said, it's, it's seeing something you admire that's, you know, self-generated because it's, you, you know, nobody's telling you you have to go to Comic-Con and dress up like the, your favorite character. You're doing that because you're so inspired by the story of that character that it makes you want to embody it in that small way. And I, this is what I was kind of get, alluding to when I was talking about my experience with this, the stories that transformed me, where I realized exactly what you're saying, which is like, well, if I really admire that, then why should I be working all the time to, to, to become as, to put myself into as close alignment with that as possible? That's right. And the cool thing about that is that, you know, a lot of times when I talk about stories and my fascination with them, I tend to go abstract because it's, my mom, that's what interests me. Mm -hmm. But it's also extremely practical because as soon as you think that way, it tells you, well, okay, what are the specific particular ways of acting that you can identify that, um, that constitute that character, right? Or, or whatever that, or that way of being. And then you can start to build practices into your life that, that, that move you in that direction or get rid of things that move you away from it. Mm -hmm. And those are things you can start to identify as soon as you've actually identified what the, the traits are that, that are there at the bottom. And so in my, I've actually, I have this, this um, it's a technique that I developed based on this idea. It's called, I call it smart streaming. Um, you know, if you're like, if you're streaming on Netflix, Maybe you can do it in a smarter way where it's something that you actually are getting information from instead of mindlessly watching. And it's like, okay, well, here's a process for watching something. And when you feel something in relationship to a character, mining it for some information about what it's telling you about what you value. And it's, it, I think it's so powerful because it's not enforced by anyone else. You know, no one's telling you do this because it's the right thing to do or, you know, whatever. It's you literally coming up with it out of some part of your being that's partially you, partially, you know, culturally constructed and giving you some impulse towards, you know, moving in a direction that's, that's powerful for you. And I think people really respond to that because then they're, they're not being told what to do. <laughs> they're not, uh, they're not even, they're not even being convinced that it's the right thing to do. They're actually feeling the need to go do it. Yeah. And so um, that's kind of, that's been kind of a powerful thing for me personally in, in my life. Well, we're, we're just about out of time. Why don't you flesh out a little bit of, of if there might be, if there's something else you want to quick get in, but mm -hmm. you know, where people can find you and send me an email. My email address is just my name at Gmail. Send okay. me an email with any links that you'd like to include. I want to put this, I want to, I'm going to put you up on the queue a little bit in terms of the, okay. the stack of conversations, because I want this one to get out there. Oh, and and I want people to know more about what you do because I think, I think actually, you know, when I listen to what you just described, I think there for Christian leaders, that's a very small segment of my audience. Um, you know, what you just described, I think is, is very much a helpful idea for ways of explaining something about Christian discipleship, because mm. in a sense, in a sense, this is the role that Jesus plays for yeah. us. Mm. And, and I, you know, I really like the way that you put that. So, so yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, well, that, that, that's, uh, that to me is one of the, the realizations I've, I've come to fairly later in life, but that has been one of the more powerful ones, you know, is that these, these stories have these characters and that they're not just characters to watch and then feel is an enforcing judge, but they're characters to, to, to feel resonance with wherever you feel it and then um, use it. Um, so if I would, would point people to, you know, that, that aspect of my work, I would say uh, 
you know, uh, my website is thecharacterarc.com. Um, that's arc, A-R-C, uh, not A-R-K. Um, but uh, dot com, and there actually I have a guide to that technique that I was just telling you about, smart streaming, which kind of walks people through that process. It's part of the character arc course, which is um, kind of the the course element of my of my project. But it's just a free giveaway that people can use the, to learn that technique on their own and then go out and try it out. Um, I also have um, a podcast where I actually talk about a lot of uh, the kind of things that we've been talking about today. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, and I've been doing that for a little over a year. We we had a, a kind of a shift in the direction of it recently, but okay. all the episodes are us talking about fiction and kind of what the implications of the stories that we love are to our daily lives, and sometimes just more abstract uh, topics. And and I did a, a podcast recently on um, Godzilla and some of the archetypal themes in the Godzilla series. Really so cool. I, I go out there, but but it, it should be interesting for anyone who's interested in, in these kind of ideas. And it's just called the Character Arc Podcast, and it's on you know, all the major podcasting um, uh, platforms. Um, and I, I would also encourage people, anyone who's interested in self-authoring, you know, who's anyone who's interested in self-authoring, to do a future authoring program or past authoring, any of them, um, to join our self-authoring collaboration group. That's really a really great group of people who are all working towards the same goal, like sorting themselves out. And um, even people who just have questions about the, the suite and want to find out more about it can come there. And everybody there has been, it's been a really positive community. I mean, I, being on the internet isn't always the most positive ex experience, especially on social media, but this group has been a really great one for, for, for people and for me. So, so yeah, that's where people can find me. Okay. Well, I, I found that too. I, you know, when I, I kind of started this YouTube channel accidentally and I was, I had a lot of fear and trembling about what YouTube comments would be, but you know, a community yeah. has grown around it via the comments and the conversation videos, and it's it's been it's been just wonderful. And I've been, yeah. you know, even as a Calvinist who's supposed to be pessimistic about human nature, I've been delighted by the people that I've found, including you. This has been I, I'm I, I so one of the things that over the next couple, of, I'm not going to take conversations for a few weeks because I have to figure out how to structure all of this because I mm. I want to keep. I, I need to keep having conversations with people I don't know be so that I can meet people like you. And this has been, this has been just terrific. I'm so excited about this conversation. Yeah, this has been fantastic for me too. And, and before I know you want to, we got to end in a minute, but I wanted to say thank you again, one for you know, everything you're doing with your channel, which I think is fantastic. And two for having me on and being willing to have this conversation with me. It's been really, really fun. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to find your Facebook group. And have you talked to Jordan Peterson about your work? Does he know about your work? Uh, I, I know. I mean, if he does, it's only tangentially, not through me. Uh, I did reach out to selfauthoring.com at one point um, because we have some people in the group who are from places where they can't use online payment systems or they are just financially disadvantaged. And yeah. so I reached out to them to get some vouchers for, uh, for those people who are in that situation. And um, they, they, were, they were kind enough to give me some. So I've kind of communicated with the self-authoring website, but not with Jordan Peterson directly, although hopefully at some point. Well, if I if I get the chance, I'm going to mention this because I think this is, I think this is something that he would be very excited about and should be because again, as I said, when I saw what was happening around him, I knew that just like you said, it's the gym membership problem. I love that. I'm going to steal that. Pastors are thieves. Yeah. So if you um, give me good stuff, I'll rip it off. But that's exactly right. It's the gym membership problem. People get excited, but and that's why I start. I've started meetup groups because. People need a, this is just church. People yeah, need yes, a community yeah. to encourage them on because otherwise just the dissipation of life, it just brings us back down to uh, uselessness. So I totally agree. Well, thank you so much. And I very much want to talk again at some point. Yeah, and I will check out your links and I'll subscribe to your podcast. And I'm, I'm thrilled at the work that you're doing. Yeah, and you too. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll talk to you again soon. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.